Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to Your Island, Your Voice. This is an extremely important, unprecedented event. Certainly, this is the first time that we've done something like this in partnership with the Bermuda government. And we are so thankful for all of you that are in attendance here and around the world. We want to thank the Premier of Bermuda for going on social media. I think that's pretty uh, a first as well reaching out and seeing, you know, if people wanted to have this sort of, you know, form to share their ideas and to, you know, put themselves forward to say that we all, everybody in this room and around the world is tuning in. We, we really want Bermuda to be better, both now and in the future. So this is powerful. This is, this is, I'm almost lost for words just, you know, looking at all of you and imagining how many people are actually tuning in around the world. I, I, I heard a couple seconds ago that they have a big gathering in Manchester, but you know, you can pretty much, I mean, Bermudians, we love to travel, so we are all around the world. And so the engagement and the involvement for something like this, this is truly unprecedented. And um, you know, it's been said already, just be respectful of, of the Premier and each other and also time. Time is our most valuable resource, and the most questions that we can get will make this event even more powerful. This is not a debate. This is, is really putting all that we can in the time that we have on the table so that we can allow the leaders of this country and, and ourselves to just reflect on everything that everyone wants for this island. So with that being said, because time is precious, we're going to go into the first question. So, the Honorable Premier, I'm going to break the ice for you because out of everyone in this room, you're the only one that's been in, not an ordinary citizen, we're all extraordinary citizens, right? But to go from an extraordinary citizen to now, you know, being the, the leader of this country, I mean, certainly it's easy to sit back and say, you know, as a leader, you should, you know, be at the forefront and, and have the most tools at your fingertips to, to, to make changes. But becoming Premier, surely from, from day one to now, you probably wake up and realize that there's no cape, there's no magic wand, and limited resources. So what's that dynamic like for you? Thanks, Keen. Uh And good evening to everyone here, and good evening to everyone who may be watching. I joked about uh, my non-existent magic wand the other day, um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's difficult, it's a challenge um, inside of this job. But the fact is that Bermuda has a lot more tools uh, than ever other countries have. And the reason why I wanted to, um, I reached out to uh, see if this event was of interest was because I was, on, uh, I was online, and the only social media I actually engage in myself is Twitter, and I was seeing a lot of these comments. Someone was like, oh, Bermuda is going to be screwed unless the uh, young people are in charge, and, and, I, and I see lots of things which aren't necessarily accurate, and I wanted to see if there was actually an interest in this type of form. And I was actually surprised by the response. I was expecting that it'll be a little bit less for people who are like, no, I don't want to hear. But I think I was gratified when I saw the response and persons actually said, yes, I'd actually like to hear and would actually like to engage. But on a daily basis, it's a challenge. It's a challenge like every Bermudian has. Um, balancing uh, family, balancing work, uh, balancing the things which you have to do on any given day. Uh, but I count it as a blessing each and every day that I have this job. And there are days that are special when you actually get to make differences in people's lives, which make, you know, which actually make a difference. So again, if you're tuning in online, don't forget to tweet, 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 a thousand tweets. Just put it all out there at Bermuda Premier and also the hashtag Your Voice BDA. Uh, we have a great team that's taken all of that in. In real time, why did you choose this event and why was it RSVP? only when a larger venue could have been used? A, a few persons asked that question, and we actually, uh, when they originally had this venue set up, um, it was about 50, and I said, you know, extend it, uh, let's see, and so I think we made it to about 80 and 85. Um, I would say that that wasn't a particular decision, it was just in order to have a real conversation, I think you want to make sure that you have it small and intimate so people can actually have an opportunity to interact as opposed to a, um, a, a larger cycle. But the fact is that I try to remain engaged and to ask questions. So this is just one 
of the opportunities, I think, that will just continue with engagement. Many have made comments online that this event is purely performance and a PR stunt just to gain the younger Bermudian vote. How do you feel about this? How can you certify that what is being voiced and discussed here will turn into actionable change to better our current problems in Bermuda? Um, I think that politicians will always be accused of things. Anything that a politician does is going to be accused of just trying to get votes. Um, from the perspective of where I look at this, I want to actually engage because I think what's most important is the sharing of information. Um, politics is not something that uh, a lot of people like. Um, it's something that on a daily basis sometimes I don't like myself. Uh, but what I would say is that what's more important than politics is policies. Um, having those thoughts, having that feedback, having those ideas. And I have uh, been in, I would say, frontline politics since the age of 27 or 28 when I was elected to be chairman of the Progressive Labor Party. And so I recognize that politicians don't always have the monopoly on ideas. So there's good ideas which come. Um, some of them will be able to be actioned. Some of them are not realistic. Others may be things that we may not have considered or just possibly a different approach in the way in which we're doing things. So I think it's important not only to hear opinions, but also to share information about what the government is currently doing and how persons can actually take advantage. Because when I knock on doors, a lot of times people don't actually know certain things that are actually available for them. The PLP and OBA seem to care about themselves and their interests. Why should I care about politics or politicians? And that's coming from Watchman underscore 144K. Um, I would uh, probably say I don't expect, uh, I, would, I want all of you to care about me and my well-being. I just want to say that. Um, care about my uh, family and I care about uh, people's well-being, certainly. Uh, but I think more important than caring about politicians themselves, it's certainly about caring about the policies uh, which are put into place. And any, any given time when there is work that has to be done, any time there's feedback, it's always a question of the policies which are there to fix uh, particular situations. I don't want to tell too much stories, but I'm going to harken back to uh, when I was elected as chairman of the Progressive Labor Party a, a while ago, and my family it was actually in the opportunity to sponsor the Devonshire Recreation Club. And I had never actually been to the Devonshire Recreation Club before uh, my uh, family uh, was sponsoring that football team. And I remember after a few uh, weeks of being out there, after being introduced to the team, uh, there were young men who came to my office, and this was, I want to say, 2009. And I am the first person in my family to go to college. I don't consider myself uh, to be from a wealthy family, but I was so shocked and surprised with the pain and the hurt of young men that they were feeling and experiencing at that time. And the response of which I gave to my colleagues at was I actually told a few people that I was embarrassed to be the chairman of the Progressive Labor Party when I saw what was going on. And I said it was either two things, you don't know, or you don't care. For me, it was I didn't know. And though I don't particularly feel that, um, at, given my circumstance that I lived in a bubble, it was a fact that regardless of the work of which I did and regardless of what I, the circles of which I was in, I did not see that challenge that existed in society. And at that point in time, I committed myself to making sure that I did understand and get, uh, got to know not only the young men that are around the clubs and got involved in club life and made sure that I could do my best to assist and to understand the challenges. Because if you're working, I didn't work in international business, I worked in IT, but sometimes you don't get to see that exposure and to see all the different sides of Bermuda and the challenges of which exist and how you can actually, um, how, what the things of which you actually have to understand in order to affect the change which is necessary. Okay. And at any point, you know, if you're, if you're here, you can, you can go up to one of those mics and ask a question. Um, but I'm going to move on to another question. And all the questions that I have came online. Again, this event was completely RSVP within hours. And the amount of questions that we have got is just incredible. I have a whole book on my lap. So this is on the government. And this is coming from Christina THFC. It is no secret that, the, that Bermuda is in serious economic trouble, I would argue, the world. Uh, the PLP has been in power for the majority of my life. Therefore, the economic woes of this country lay squarely at the feet of past and present PLP administrations. 
Why should any young person believe that you or your party can turn it around when your party is largely the cause of it? Well, I don't necessarily agree uh, with <clears throat> the premise of the question, but here's what I can say. I can say from 1998 to 2008, in Bermuda there was unprecedented economic growth. The size of the economy doubled. Um, and so from that perspective, I think that when persons will um, look at the bad, um, they will not remember the good. And that's easy, and that's something that politicians um, can accept. What I can say also is that I live in this country, my children are going to live in this country, my family lives in this country, and we want the best for this country. But I think we also have to recognize that the way that Bermuda is set up in some instances is not entirely fair and beneficial. We have a system, I would say, or the way that we have in Bermuda, is that there are those persons in this country who will struggle, and there are those persons who have vast amounts of financial wealth. And unlike in other countries where vast amounts of wealth are used for the, to assist those persons who are struggling, in the Bermuda context it isn't. So when we saw the unprecedented growth from 1998 until 2008, uh, the fact is that although there were significant investments that were made then, which are benefiting Bermuda now, there was also challenges then, and we have to continue to address those challenges now. So during the next, I would say, uh, period after the recession until today, Bermuda's economy hasn't grown. Bermuda's economy is still stagnating. But I don't actually believe that we are, and I would say this, as dire economic straits as some would want to say. I say that because um, the Minister of Finance is going to give his budget statement. We are seeing that payroll tax receipts are stronger than we would expected. That means that there is job growth that is happening inside of uh, the economy. And so that's something that is particularly positive. But I think what's also necessary is that we have to convert our economy to one of the future. Bermuda should not be a place where we have to pay higher rates for um, interest than our competing islands do. Bermuda should not be a place where we have to pay higher rates for health insurance than our competing islands do. And so it's a matter of fixing and addressing those problems, which in many instances are systemic. Again, on your government and previous governments, I think, um, the question is that currently our political system supports selecting unqualified individuals to be slotted into ministerial state, uh, positions in maintaining party lines. Do you recognize this as a key issue in our past and present failures? And that's from Tara Cassidy. Um, I would not necessarily agree. And the reason why I don't agree is that ministers in a cabinet cell government, which is the style of government of which Bermuda has, ministers are there to carry out and execute government policy. Ministers aren't doing day-to-day -day execution of particular issues. And I think that's a common misconception. So for instance, the Minister of Education is here and there was a challenge with Delwood yesterday. The minister doesn't find out about the challenge until after the challenge has appeared because that's not the type of stuff that makes it to the level of a minister on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're not running the day-to-day -day ministries. We're not looking in various departments. We set the overall policy and it's for dedicated public officers to go ahead and to execute those particular perspectives. So no, I don't particularly accept uh, that. What I can say, however, is that part of government is making sure that you listen. Part of government is an accepting um, uh, that people may have different and better ideas. I think that, unfortunately, the media and the environment will make it seem as though if the two political parties don't agree with each other that often. Um, about 90% of legislation which passed through the House of Assembly passed on a bipartisan basis without any challenge. It's only for things that are actually contentious issues and different ideological issues where you see that contention. But by and large, when it comes to dealing with uh, Bermuda's economy, when it comes to dealing with international business, when it comes to dealing with the upgrades of which we need to make to our social infrastructure, I think that those things are by and large supported by both sides. So I think that the differences in some cases can be overstated. Okay, and we have a question, two questions from the audience. I don't know who stood up first. So we'll start on <coughs> right. Hello. Um, so today we had one of our first cruise ships come in for the seasons, correct? And what I experience is a frequent and prevalent issue as someone who catches the bus, which is that it sails right by me, full of tourists. 
And this isn't, a, this isn't an issue I think the government is unaware of. In fact, we've had this issue with both governments, and I see no solution. So I was wondering if you had any plans moving forward to deal with this common issue. I thank you very much for your question. Um, one of the challenges of which we have, I don't, want to, I don't want to get into a budget challenge because it's, it is a lack of investment in the public transportation system over the years. What I will say is that in the next budget, there's certainly going to be more. But you want to say something as a follow-up? Yeah, because based on my understanding, and as someone who's caught the bus regularly, I noticed the decline in the quality of the buses when the PLP specifically gave away the, um, the main sources of income for the bus company. Do you guys take, see the long-term effects of your, um, your idealism? Here's what I would say. I would say I, I think you're talking about the, um, the decision that was probably made in 2007 uh, to allow students to ride the uh, buses for yeah. free. And I know that, that for some persons it's controversial. Um, for me, I believe it was good policy. Uh, I think that to have public transportation, I think what you want to make sure is you have public transportation that is as um, economic as possible um, and that is affordable as possible. But from the overall perspective, when we look at public transportation, it's what ails a lot of the challenges in Bermuda. And it's an issue of um, looking at how we actually do things better for the future. Technology allows us to be able to actually have dynamic routing of buses now. Technology enables us to have smaller buses in the future that will enable us to get more persons from place to place. And what I can say is if you're asking about what are we going to be doing in the future, about that, I would say that the transportation green paper laid out um, the different options and what we now have in this upcoming budget is going to be additional money to invest in not only putting technology into buses so we can understand when the buses are coming, but also to invest in new buses, new uh, buses with uh, cleaner energy, whether it be electric or others, and also to examine how we can possibly have smaller buses so that we can actually manage the traffic flow which is necessary. Will any of this be implemented for this upcoming summer season, or will we see a return of the same issues? Um, there will be more buses on order. Um, I know that there's more buses that are coming on island, um, that, uh, that are scheduled to come on island, so that much I do know. Um, we have uh, ordered new buses, so that will, there'll be less, and we see our number of bus cancellations has certainly reduced. But the specific question of which you're speaking about, about the fact that when cruise ships come in, and public, public persons get left off the bus. It is something that not only are we aware of, it is the reason why we've asked cruise companies to pay more money to the government so we can specifically invest in the transportation infrastructure, and those are things which are going to be announced uh, this uh, Friday in the budget. So will it be fixed for this particular tourism season? We're going to certainly do our best, but I know that by the next tourism season when we have additional buses that are on island, I think that we'll be in a better situation. Okay, thank you for your questions. I'm going to move over to the left. Good evening. Um, you mentioned just a little while ago that you feel we shouldn't have to pay higher rates for health insurance. To the board. However, I would like for you to explain to us in the most dumbest way possible, because as someone who works in the private center, where I know that even though my health insurance may go up, I'm getting the care that I'm relying on, I enjoy my major medical um, benefits. So I would like for you to tell us why this would be better or on the same level, and why I should want to you know, be a part of the new health initi initiative, as opposed to being able to choose whether or not I continue to pay for my major medical. Thank you for asking the question. I'm going to stand up a little bit to stretch out. Um, I'm going to try my best to answer it in as simple as way possible. Right now, everybody in the country who has health insurance has a portion of their health insurance called the standard health benefit. That standard health benefit covers hospitalization, diagnostic imaging services, and some home health care services. That's all that's in the basic package. So every single person here who has health insurance is a part of the standard health benefit. It's provided across the board. The a premise of what the government is doing is expanding that basic level, that core package, which every single person has access to. So right now, the only thing that is required under law is the standard health benefit, which is hospital services 
and uh, the diagnostic imaging. To expand that to cover hospital services as well, doctor's visits, specialist visits of a small prescription drug benefit, and other particular items. So that is the so to basically pool that the persons in the country right now everyone is in the, the smaller package, and we're going to expand that to the larger package. Every single person who has major medical will still be able to continue with major medical and choose what supplementary benefits you have. So right now, there's a core package, and everyone has a larger package on top of that. All we're doing is expanding the benefits of the core package so that it covers more items and that it has a better risk pooling for the entire population. What it has found is that if everyone is in the same basic pool, that means that costs will be able to be more controlled and you won't have those fluctuations of which you have where some people may see their health insurance rates go up 20% and others may see a smaller increase because everyone is in the same pool. So the best way that I can explain it is, you're not going to lose your major medical coverage, you're not going to lose your access to your doctors, et cetera. The basic core package of which everyone in the country is required to be a part of will expand to cover more items. That's the premise of the change. Okay, so now that basic core package is expanded, mm -hmm. Someone who couldn't actually afford health insurance before now falls into that pool? Um, the fact, and, and that's an excellent question, because a lot of persons are talking about universal health care coverage. We have a coverage gap in Bermuda, and this change is not going to fix that entire coverage gap. I just have to be clear about that. It's not going to. But the premise of this is that we have a challenge with the escalating cost of health care in the country. And in order to make sure that you can better control the growing costs of health care, the experts have recommended that you should pool persons into various insurance pools, which will lessen so you spread the risk. Right now, the risk may be spread against 500 people here, 500 people here, 500 people here. If it's spread across the entire population, that smooths the increases and in changes in health insurance. The persons who do not have access to health care now, the persons who can't afford health care currently, whether they be seniors, who is a large majority of persons, those persons are currently getting the HIP program, which is, uh, which is through uh, financial assistance. And they will just typically transfer from the HIP program to the basic plan. So the government will pay for that? The government's paying for it now. So that will stay the same? Yes, government's paying for it now. I mean, all of us inside of this room right now with our taxpayer dollars are subsidizing HIP. Here's the challenge. Under the current structure right now, health insurers, so if I go to a health insurance company and I want to get major medical benefits, if, if I'm sick, the health insurance company can say, no, I'm not going to cover you. And that means that that person then has to go to the government. That means the government has the bad risk and the health insurers keep the good risk. And so putting everyone in the same pool means that people can't pick and choose their risk and it's spread across the entire population. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Happy to answer the question. And we're going to move to another online question. Uh, again, keep your tweets coming in. And uh, the hashtag is your voice BDA. Uh, we have about 300 people right now live streaming. Oh, mercy. 400. In a couple moments, it's going to be 500. This is coming from at Rena, R E N N A H. And uh, her question is when. We're all looking at her. <laughs> when are we going to see real big change for accessibility? Access is not just about elevators and sidewalks, which are both hugely lacking in Bermuda, but also about information, events, services, healthcare, and so much more. Um, Hannah, you are correct. We do a very bad job of it. We actually do. And um, I'm fortunate to have inside of my caucus um, Tanae Farber. And she reminds me, I'll give you a perfect example. The other day we launched um, a program uh, for seniors uh, to be able to get interest-free loans to renovate their homes. And she came to me and she said, why, the thing is we always affiliate being senior with being disabled when they're able-bodied seniors, but there's also people who are not seniors who are not able-bodied as well. And that's a challenge that we have to come to grips with. We do not do enough. Um, in this country for persons who are differently able. We don't. That is a fact. And so I appreciate you raising that question. Today always is on me about it. 
Um, she is constantly in our ear, and what you would have seen is that I had, uh, at our annual delegates conference, the Progressive Labor Party's annual delegates conference, every year we come into a caucus, we go over the things that are inside of our platform, which we have not yet executed, and we look at what are the things that we want to make a priority for this year. And we also have our, our uh, colleagues to submit the things which they want as well. And one of the things which was uh, one of the top vote-getters, one of the things which was the top vote-getters, was uh, this issue of making sure that we implement the disability access plan, mm -hmm. which was laid out before. So, and it is, I mean, it's the small things. It's for instance, when I give, um, when even, even at this event right now, I mean, if there was someone who had a hearing difficulty, it, and it's stuff that we have to get better at. And mm -hmm. so I will admit that it's something that yeah. I have been, I, won't, I will say I'm often reminded of, and we certainly have to get better at. Okay, thank you for your response. Um, I actually was speaking to um, MP Tanae Ferbert recently, um, and she mentioned that there are baby steps being taken, and that's why I worded my question that way. When are we going to see big changes? Because this is really important. Um, you know, if everyone in Bermuda can't access the same things that everyone else can, then that's a problem. So um, I think we need to do more. I, I will accept you need to do more, and, I'm, and I hate giving the answer that on any given day we have to choose between um, sometimes bad options and the things which uh, have to take the priority and uh, precedence. Mm -hmm. um, so from that aspect, but I think that there is, that we can do more, and when you ask the question when, I can't give you an answer for that. But I will recognize that from a perspective of just on a basic level of inclusion. And it needs to just form part of our DNA. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so happy yeah. to have Tanae. Because yes. when we're in caucus, she'll remind me and we'll say, you know what? Thank you, Tanae. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Because it's something we have to consider. Yeah. She's an amazing advocate. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. We have another question that's coming on the floor. But can everyone say hi, Joe? Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. Joe just logged in from Rhode Island. It's the smallest state in the U.S. <laughs> I graduated. I took geography, but again, shout out to everybody that's tuning in around the world. Use the hashtag, your voice, BDA. So we're going to we start. You were standing first, right? So. Um, so my question is actually more so back in line with the health insurance situation. So health insurance, you were basically mentioning that if you go to a health insurance provider and you have no insurance and you have a pre-existing condition, they'll turn you away. But that's more so for individuals than groups, correct? Uh, depending on the size of group, correct. Yes. So then what about the doctors? Because that's more of an issue than the actual insurance. I don't mind paying for insurance. I have a problem getting to a doctor and paying $300 for it. Oh, well, um, you mean paying $300 because when you have insurance? No, 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 for copay. Oh, well, I'm happy that you asked that question because one of the things that the new health plan will make sure is that we're actually regulating and capping copays. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in doctor's visits that you have, there'll be a set copay, and for specialist visits, for the services which are provided in the core plan, there'll be a set copay. That's one of the challenges which we have. The entire premise of this healthcare plan, and it has to be understood, was to reduce the out-of-pocket costs and the overall cost of healthcare spending inside of the community. That is the premise of it. So. When we first launched the plan with the mock plan, we heard from persons about what are the challenges of which you are having with your health care. Mm -hmm. Copays is one of the biggest issues, and inside of this plan, there is going to be capped copays. But I think what's important for everyone to know, and I want everyone listening and online is to know, that we have gone through a very extensive process. This process started in 2011. The minister came to cabinet for the first time in 2018. We didn't approve it to begin official consultation until 2019, and there's going to be continued consultation. Because I do like my job, I'm going to tell you that. I do like my job, and if there's one surefire way to lose your job, is to mess up someone's health care. And it's been seen it from politicians around the world. So we are taking this in a slow, methodical fashion by making sure that we consult. All the doctors are not on board right now. We are not going to be successful if they're not. And that's the reason why the outreach is still there, the Minister of Health is still there, I've said that my office door is open as well and we're going to continue that engagement. What I'm happy about is that people recognize that the way we're going right now is not sustainable and they are coming to the table and we're going to be able to advance that. But to get back to the answer to your question, the new plan for health insurance will cap co-pays for regular doctor's visits and also for two specialist visits a year. Okay, thank you. 
We'll move over to the left side here, the microphone. Good evening, everyone. So my question is, it's obvious PLP's form of generating money and OBAs is very different. I've noticed so far that PLP's been in time. Their, their way of generating money is to increase taxes. So my question to you, if your people couldn't afford the cost of living before you was elected, how would they be able to survive if the sudden increases of taxes? I thank you for the question. Um, and I have to say this, um, I pay taxes too, and the Progressive Labor Party government of which I lead has um, increased uh, my taxes. Can I no. just say something really quick? Yes, first? you may. But you are the premier, so you are making way more oh, than I other accept people that, but, but, but allow me to get to this, because this, <laughs> cause, cause this is the key. I accept it wholeheartedly, but here's the thing. The Progressive Layer Party government has lowered taxes on those persons making $96,000 or less. And t persons making $96,000 or less right now on employee taxes are paying their lowest level in 23 years. What is more important as well, and this comes to the fairness of our tax system, there is going to be more reductions to workers that are at the lower scale. So if you have one job or two jobs, then that means that you're going to be having more money in your pocket because that's the challenge in Bermuda. It is an unfair system and one of the things of which we also change and we talk about this thing about increasing our taxes because I recognize fully that taxes is a concern. And there is never a point in time when you sit around the table, at the, the cabinet table on Tuesday, and actually sit here and say, we want to go ahead and, you know, and take joy in raising these taxes. It's something that has to uh, certainly be balanced. But here's the good news I have for you. The era of tax increases is over. We have gotten our budget to the place of balance, and now it's about returning money to individuals, persons who need it the most, while making sure that we can continue to make the investments in education and health care, which are required. When we inherited uh, the, the government back, we had a budget deficit of about $100 million. Mm -hmm. uh, we did not increase spending by any appreciable amount, which has caused us a lot of particular challenges, but we had to try our best to fill uh, that budget hole. But I'm going to give you this pledge today. I am certain that on Friday, the Minister of Finance will not be raising your taxes, mm -hmm. unless you make more than $235,000 a year. No, but I understand your vision. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if the people who are, on, who are making under the 90K feel that, feel what you're saying physically in their pockets. Um, I don't know if they do feel it because the fact is the cost of living in Bermuda is still an incredible challenge. It's been the biggest issue from when I first entered elected politics uh, way back in 2006 and it's still a very large issue now. But the fact is that we've had a system of taxation in this country which, is, which some people can regard as the most regressive on the planet. And so it's crazy that people who, you know, make $48,000 a year are paying less of a percentage of their money in taxes than people who are making a million dollars a year or $2 million a year. We have changed that. We have made sure that people are paying their fair share. So some money of which you've seen in the increases in taxes, before companies that were operating in Bermuda that owned stores would take dividends out of their company and not pay any taxes on that. So they'll put a little level, they'll say, I'm only paying, my, paying myself this amount. Mm -hmm. They'll take the rest of their money in um, dividends and not pay any taxes. We put an end to that because we don't believe that it's fair. But what mm -hmm. I can tell you is that on Tuesday, the persons under $96,000 will feel it a lot more. Okay. okay, thank you for that question. We're gonna come over to the right. Me? Me? Sure. Good evening. Um, just to touch back on health care. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned co-pays. I think wait times is also an issue with um, the health care system. I work in, pri in the private sector, and a lot of the people who complain about their co-pays are government employees. So it just seems like maybe al um, allowing for government employees an option of private or supplemental insurance, which would maybe increase their premium slightly, but overall lower their co-pays. It just seems like a more logical Excellent or solution rather than decreasing my major medical benefits. No one is planning on decreasing your major medical benefits at all. But I'll have to have supplemental, is that um, correct? Major medical is supplemental. No, I'm sorry, with the Bermuda Health Plan, I'll mm -hmm. have to then purchase or... I, I, and that's why I think that it's important for me to make sure that this is clear because a lot of people don't understand that. Okay. Right now, we technically have two health care plans, everyone who has it. There's a standard, standard health benefit, mm -hmm. which is the core plan. Understood. And then there's the supplemental plan on top of it. Understood. So we all now have a core plan and supplemental. Okay. GHI, which government insurers has, is a supplemental plan. HIP, which is a basic plan, is a supplemental plan. 
future care as a supplemental so, yeah, plan. Yeah, so it's about expanding that. the core and then people will still have supplementary coverage and be free to choose their supplementary coverage. Do you think that my premium will be more than what I'm paying now? I, those figures have not been finalized. And because, allow me to say this. Okay. This is one of the challenges which we're experiencing with the health care reform debate right now. We have been very clear that the government is continuing to consult, to listen, and work through this particular process. And we are being attacked by persons saying, well, how come you can't answer my question? And what we're saying is that we have gone out to consultation. We have said, this is what plans could possibly look like. What do you think should be included? What do you think should not be included? When that final determination is made, then there can be actuarial analysis that is done okay. to determine what that will be. But the point of where we are right now is to determine what does the future of the healthcare system look like. And that's been the continued conversation the government's having. So you feel like that's revamping the whole system would be better or more beneficial to everybody than just maybe tweaking the people that you already insure? Because mm -hmm. those are the people that complain the most. I accept what you're saying, but the, but that's to... Because, I'm sorry, sorry, because okay. I go to a, a physical, my co pays 20 Okay, we have to wrap this. Someone else goes from who's a government employee, their same physical, same service, their co pays 150 and Di they don't understand why. Different people have different, different people have different benefits, and I accept what you're saying, mm -hmm. but the fundamental premise of what we're trying to address is an, is a healthcare system itself and a health financing system, which is not fair. And so at the basis of it, where you have places where companies can pick and choose risk, it means that, that things are shifted to one section of the population and other. And what we're trying to do is to make that entire process more fair. Okay, okay thank you. This question is coming from Christina Roberts online. So I know the lines are building for the microphones. We have to balance between the online questions and the questions here. Is it true that a local insurance company offered to cover the uninsured if the PLP government agreed to leave healthcare as it is and the government turned down the offer? Um, I will <laughs> answer that question two ways. Number one, I saw something that was posted by that online. I said that I don't know who the single insurance company is, but health insurers will not insure people with pre-existing conditions now if they pay. So I cannot possibly imagine why health insurers will all of a sudden decide to insure the people who are paying for insurance to then insure them for free. And if someone is making that, then it might actually be an indication that the system itself is not fair and can be structured in a better and more fair fashion. Okay, we're gonna to move to our left. Good afternoon. Um, I, have, I myself am a healthcare professional and a lot of my clients base their treatment based on what their insurance costs. The new government health care plan is going to be So how do you correct amount of treatment that's required for the patients to receive in order to get adequate health care and not have patients neglect the health care and they'll come back to see me years or months later and expect me to play Jesus? Thank you very much. What I would say to the answer to that question is, that no, it is not about less. It is about expanding the core package. So what people are saying is that the health plan of which is offered is all that they'll be able to have, and that is not correct. Everyone right now has a core package and supplementary benefits on top of that. Every single person will be able to have supplementary benefits on top of that if they wish, as they currently do not have right now. So as I said, GHI, HIP, Major Medical from Colonial, BFNM, Argus are all supplementary coverage on top of the base plan. And so those supplementary coverage will continue to still exist. What we are doing is expanding the base plan. And the reason why we expand the base plan to cover a larger pool, as I said, is to make the system more fair, more sustainable to control costs. But it's also important to recognize that if the core plan includes prevention, which right now the plan does not, because the core plan does not give you access to the doctor's visits, does not give you access to specialist visits. If the core plan includes that, that means that persons will actually access those services more than they do now, which means that they will have a healthier population in the long run and less persons that are using the hospital, which is the most expensive place to deliver healthcare coverage, uh, more. Okay, so how do you plan to collaborate with the healthcare professionals to get the proper plan? 
I am happy to say that that's what this whole purpose of this consultation has been. So the Minister of Health has had over 60 individual meetings with many sexual health care professionals, over 500 persons have attended those meetings. The Health Council is continuing to have those meetings and that consultation. There's working groups which have been set up to look at the various aspects of the consultation which has come back and nothing is going to be finalized until we have everyone on board because that's what's important. Are Healthcare is too important. Okay, Are we also collaborating with the government bodies? This is my last one. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. It's because right now we have a we have a hybrid healthcare system that is both public sector and private sector, and in the future we're still going to have a hybrid system that is going to be a combination of the public sector and the private sector. The private sector does play an important role in healthcare, health insurance, and controlling costs. But what we also have to recognize is that the system is unfair where private insurers can pick and choose their risks and pass the bad risk on to taxpayers. We want to have a full pool for everyone with the basic coverage, which will mean the system of financing is more fair, and that means that we're going to be better able to control costs as we go forward. This is a long-term change. People are saying that this is rushed. We started this process in 2011. We are now here, and the, in the, the implementation of this plan is not expected to happen between the next three and five years. So it's a process that we have to go through because it is a very large change. Okay, okay we're about halfway through the session, so we're going to go into rapid fire. If you could just keep your questions to just one question instead of follow-up questions, we could just keep it tight. So we're going to move over to the right side. All right, before I ask my question, you got something on the list there about housing already, like home ownership for us? Because if you do, then I'm going to not ask that. You can ask it. Just ask uh, it. Go okay, ahead. so yeah, home ownership for the under 35 folks. Uh, home ownership's the biggest driver of generational wealth. How do we get into the housing market? Happy that you asked that question. <laughs> yes, clap, clap, clap. Happy that you asked that question. It's, it's, it's a particular challenge in Bermuda, the fact that number one, housing is difficult to afford. Um, especially when you um, are starting out. And so what we've looked at is what has been done in other jurisdictions around the world where these particular problems can be addressed. One of the issues are, in my view, is that we have to have more housing in the city of Hamilton. That's just been my view. So right now, remember, as long as we've lived, uh, the cathedral has been the, the ceiling. Limit. Yeah. Um, and the conversation I had with people is, one day there will be buildings in the city of Hamilton that will be taller than the cathedral. Why not next year? The fact is that that is no longer the restriction for height and that is no longer the policy of the government of Bermuda. And so by March 31st, there's going to be a new plan for the Northeast Hamilton Economic Empowerment Zone, which may also be expanded to raise those height restrictions. In addition to the raise of the height restrictions, what we've done in a recent change to law is that we're going to have these things called approved residential schemes. And when we talk about approved residential schemes, there's not only going to be tax benefits to that, but what we're going to allow individuals to do is to withdraw money from their private pension to place down payments on properties to help them get onto the property ladder in these particular apartments so that they can start owning their own thing. So just like um, from this perspective as we have in various cities, those are going to be, they might be studio apartments, they may be one bedroom apartments, but they're a way for persons to start getting on top of the housing ladder. The extension of that uh, down payment issue, however, is not just limited to approved residential schemes and will be able to be rolled out in uh, other places. Also, what's the progress with the guarantees against the mortgages to decrease interest rates? Happy you asked that question. What we're waiting for is for final approval of a, uh, uh, the government has signed an agreement uh, with a banking partner and we're waiting for that uh, process to be finalized through the Bermuda Monetary Authority. I've told persons that we can expect that the second quarter of this year. Um, I've spoken to the banking partners and they said that's realistic and that's the plan because it's weird. Bermuda, because Bermuda was never a banking jurisdiction, we do not have a lot of banking competition. So I recognize, and it's inconceivable for me, that the same bank that we have in this country offers mortgage rates in a different jurisdiction that are lower than the mortgage rates they offer inside of their home jurisdiction. That's a challenge. We need to have lower mortgage rates. And what we are doing is we said that if the banks aren't going to do it voluntarily, which they have not, we are going to put the balance sheet of the government to work in order to make sure that happens. 
And so that guarantee program will be delivered in the second quarter this year because it is essential. All right, thanks. All right. We're parking healthcare questions because it seemed to, you know, take up most of this discussion. However, keep tweeting your questions because every tweet goes on the record. The premier is not sleeping until he reads every single tweet. <laughs> A follow-up question on housing, and this is online. The homeless are getting younger and younger, and simply providing shelter is not enough. Substance abuse, mental health, lack of skills, and trauma are all examples of issues that lead to homelessness. A facility filled with qualified staff to address these needs is vital. What is the status of a new homeless shelter? And that's coming from Danny Bronx. It's a uh, great question, um, and I'm sh I probably should have done this next week because the Minister of Finance is going to be mad at me because I might be giving out a few uh, budget secrets. But one of the things that we've recognized is that um, not only do we need more resources from the government in dealing with issues of mental health, because that's particularly a challenge, and we are going to make provision for that, and the Minister of Finance will likely be announcing that. Um, but what I think is also important is the issue of homelessness itself and a homeless shelter. Uh, we will recognize that the homeless shelter um, that we currently have um, is over capacity. Um, and is very old. Um, and I do know that the government um, is going to be working with the Salvation Army, um, and there will be an announcement on that uh, later. But we are going to put money and funds towards it. But the provision of a homeless shelter is not enough. There are increased issues of youth homelessness. There are um, increased issues that are dealing when it comes to issues of uh, substance abuse and mental health. And the government has put more resources into dealing with those particular problems there are going to be additional increases next year to deal with those because it's very important that we tackle those particular issues with community organizations who are very good at doing that, so it's not necessarily the government doing it ourselves, but it is certainly a problem. But I do know that there will be funds that are going to be uh, set, set right now to increase the provision for homeless services, but it's not just, I would say, it's not just the services for the homeless itself, it's about what other services can be given to those persons who are in those situations so that they can get the treatment of which they need, deal with the substance abuse and or mental health issues that oftentimes lead to homelessness so they can uh, get to a place of productivity. Productive. Okay, thank you very much. If you're online, your boys BDA, keep the tweets coming, and on the, we're gonna take another floor question, but if you could just check in, just, just you know, I wanna comment as to some of the people that are tuning in, where they're tuning in from, that would be really, really cool. So we're gonna to move to the left. Mr. Premier, good evening everyone. My name is Monique Simons and I am a mother of a son who's currently in the public education system. Um, he's at Harrington Sound Primary in P4. It's been a challenge and that's nothing against the teachers because there are some amazing of factors. So today, quite timely, there was an article in the Royal Gazette titled, Fix It or Get Out of the Way. So this was Peter Evison, who is the ex-president of the Chamber of Commerce, and Robert Stewart, who is a former teacher. And they're stating their views on the public education system and the challenges that we face. So I quote from the article, we have more than enough well-paid jobs, but the reality is that many able-bodied Bermudians have been failed by the public education system. So, we have heard multiple empty promises and unexecuted plans over the years and how the government will fix the public education system. When can we expect to hear less broken promises and start seeing actions and improvements to help the future of Bermuda succeed in this island? Thank you, Monique, for your question. I, like you, trust, uh, trust my children's education to the public education system and my daughter uh, started um, and it's been a um, excellent experience for her um, however what you state there are there are certainly particularly challenges one of the reasons why I actually believe that the government was successful um, while the progressive Labour party government was successful in its election uh, in 2017 was because the number one issue inside of our election manifesto was education in the time in which we've been in office, we've given a cumulative 15 million additional dollars in resources to the education system, both in the public education system, Bermuda College, and training to make sure we upgrade skills and apprenticeships and scholarships, and there's more money to come. 
But money is not just the issue. There's an issue of accountability in the system, mm -hmm. and there's an issue of transformation of the system itself. Yes, exactly. But just like healthcare, we cannot rush that process. I am cognizant that I cannot go back to the polls unless I deliver on my signature promise, mm -hmm. which was to phase out the middle school system and return back to a two-tier system. The Minister of Education is here. You can have a chat with him afterwards, mm -hmm. but he knows full well that he will not be in his job if he does not deliver on that particular promise itself as well. I have persons inside of my constituency who are anxious for that change, and he has assured me that the next school year will be the last school year of our current system. But that means that we have to, and so there's been a lot of work that's gone into this. Mm -hmm. The work that's gone into this has been through the Board of Education, which has examined the various options, looked at the various facilities of which we have, and are working with it. We're now going to be bringing in a specialist team to manage the change. Now, just I want to be cute on this, to manage the change. This doesn't mean to tell us what to do, mm -hmm. but in order to make sure that we make this transition well, you need to have people who are experienced in change management. Because part of the challenge which we've had is that we have persons who are running the education system right now, and there are emergencies, like yesterday, that will pop up mm -hmm. that have to be dealt with. And if they're the people who are running the education system, are going to be charged with transforming the education system, it's going to continue to be pushed back. The Minister of Health, the Minister of Education has recognized this. That's why the Cabinet has approved funds for a specialized change management team, and that will happen. The other thing is that we're working with Bermuda First on some of the recommendations of which they had for accountability. There are some good teachers in our public school yep. system, and I'm never going to slight them. I, was, I told the Minister of Education when I went into my teacher's classroom, and I literally had a conversation at my first parent-teacher conference, I'm like, you have all this stuff to do for all these children, et cetera. It is a lot. So our teachers are stars, and we have to yep. support them more. That's the reason why we've given more resources to them, but we also have to make sure that we recognize that it's not just money. It's not, we do have old facilities, and we will be building new schools. But all of us have to have a understanding that if we keep our own selfish views, then we're never going to get to the system which we want. I'll, fi I'll finish with this one. And it was when I realized that I can't be a part of the change of the public education system. So the Minister of Education uh, said to me, he's like, well, one of the plans that we have um, to transfer the schools, there's going to have to be some consolidation, et cetera, all the rest. And he's like, one of the plans is for Northlands to go. And I was like, Northlands? You can't get rid of Northlands. My daughter goes there. And literally five minutes later, I spoke to him. I said, yeah, we can't be a part of this process. Because every single person will say, fight for their corner, fight for their corner, fight for their corner. And we have to look at the totality of the system. And as I said, that's why we're bringing in outside change managers. But the Minister of Education has assured me that next school year will be the last school year underneath the current system. And I know full well that if we don't deliver on actual, tangible education reform, then we will not be in office. And I give you that pledge. All right. Thank okay, you. Okay, Premier. And uh, to those of you that are standing, we're going to cap it with those of you that are waiting in line because we have about 10 more minutes. So we, we want to make sure that all of you get your questions in. I'm having fun. We can't Premier, we want to make sure that... I'm having fun. We can't go a little longer. Would you like to extend it, Premier? We need your stamp of approval. I am hungry, though. Slight extension override. But let's quickly go through those who are standing on the floor. So we'll take you next. All right. Good evening. Um, I'm Diani Manas. Um, my artist name is Diani Koto. Uh, what I want to address was the renaissance, 21st century renaissance for Bermuda's arts and science. Um, I feel as if uh, we need more innovations in within those industries on patterns and concepts that should be fueled. It's good that you want to um, maintain the two-tier system. That's nice, yeah. I just graduated from a three-tier system. It's, I don't know what you're trying to achieve with that, but what I'm trying to say is um, after that, I'm currently in a state where I'm 22 and I have multi-billion dollar ideas that I want you guys to endorse so that we can bring in trillions of dollars. It's... Um, I'm understanding the market of the global market and how vast and rich it is. I feel as if we should have more land. Um, it's nice that we have 21 square miles, but we have 21 square miles here and like 100 miles somewhere else. That'd be nice. Um, but I understand you guys are bouncy books and stuff, so um, I'm here. I'm a local. 
I'm not, I don't know, I'm here. So that's my question. Thank you. Oh, thank you for your question. Here's what I can say. I can say that, and I know there's a few people in the room that will agree with me, that um, we can do more for arts and culture. And I think we actually have done more for arts and culture. We've given more funding towards arts and culture and make sure that we highlight Bermudian artists and support Bermudian artists and support Bermudian entertainers and protect Bermudian entertainers inside of our system. We've done that. Um, but I think that there's a lot of young people that have talent and what we want to do is continue to be able to give them that stage to expand their talent. Regarding the ideas which you may have for business, um, what I always will say is that my door is open, but the first stop is always Bermuda Economic Development Corporation who have a team of staff that's there and they work under me to support that. One of the things of which we're also going to do, um, one of the things that the department under me is actually working on is to have a uh, platform which will allow persons who are seeking investment to go ahead and list their investment ideas and will allow other persons to see it so we can almost have a local type of crowdfunding which takes place here. Okay. So I think that we can work Also, to, um, what's your thoughts on the gentrification of the young people? Uh, currently, I have a cousin and a friend that's homeless and who has been able to maintain an apartment. Um, he was able to, he got the rent down to $50 a week. Um, he don't have that apartment no more. Uh, he has a full-time job and there's still issues there. So he's currently looking into leaving the island. So it's good that you're doing this um, Medicare reform, but how is it going to affect the people that are no longer able to live in Bermuda because they're trying to flee? And what are you doing to um, um, almost... Um, Please wrap and, up your question. Um, like, um, let's say Chan and buying these um, multi-billion dollar businesses that are in Bermuda that are almost um, trying to get permanent home, home users, um, permanent like living, whatever it is mm -hmm. that you guys are trying to implement and they're going to benefit off that. What's your, how are you going to combat that so okay. that we're not worried about someone coming in with more money? Allow me to answer your question um, about the question, I guess, of gentrification. The fact is that you have to protect against that with government policies. But what you cannot do is build a wall around Bermuda because the challenge of what we have inside of the Bermuda economy is that we invite persons to come in Bermuda, we invite persons to live in Bermuda, we invite persons to work in Bermuda, to earn a lot of money in Bermuda, and then we tell them to send their money overseas and spend it somewhere else. And that's part of the challenge which we have with our economy. And we need to make sure that more of that money is spent on the island, more of that money is invested on the island. That does not have to be to the exclusion of locals. That can actually support making sure that there can be support in others so persons can get on the housing ladder with subsidized housing, so persons can actually find places to live. So I don't look at it as an either or. I look at it in how do we make sure that we change our policies to the vast amounts of wealth which is earned on this island is actually invested inside of this island so persons can actually have the support of which they need. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. We're going to move over to the left here. Good evening, Mr. Premier. My question is, why doesn't the government have a graduate employment scheme? I find that many of us come back from university and can seek employment. There aren't enough junior level positions that have been there for years. There's no succession planning, and they're stuck in the ways, and I believe that's why the government isn't progressing. In, in, a lot of us want to get employed in the government, but how can we if we, it's nothing for us to start? Okay. Um, I thank you for your question, um, and a lot of it is timely, because um, my oath of uh, office says that I'm not allowed to discuss uh, things that take place in cabinet, so I'm not going to discuss things that take place in cabinet. I'm going to talk about a meeting I had earlier today um, in the cabinet office. And, <laughs> and one of the things that were on uh, the agenda was specifically that, and it was specifically dealing with, because we've done a lot on public service reform. Because quite frankly, the government needs to be far more efficient. We hold ourselves out to be a jurisdiction that we're trying to attract technology companies and you still can't pay for a vast majority of government services online. 
But when you're talking about getting people in, one of the things that we have restarted actually is the cabinet office internship program. We have also looked at making sure that there is succession planning inside of government. And one of the things of which I have mandated the head of the public service to do is that any position inside of the governor of Bermuda, which is filled by a guest worker, they have to have Bermudians identified to fill it. We're also in the process of now, just as you said it, creating trainee positions for certain departments where we have that so people can get in at the ground level and show their skills and show their talent. So what you're saying is it is a problem, yes. A lot of times it is very challenging to challenge persons to think outside of the box, to say this hasn't necessarily worked. So one of the things of which we're doing in the departments of which I have and in a few other departments is creating actual trainee positions. The Attorney General I know has done that in legal affairs. We're about to do that in the Information and Digital Technologies Office so that we can be more entry level positions for persons so they can come in to show and demonstrate their skills so they can then come inside and move up. And I think that's the best way of doing it. Okay. On the issue of people not moving up and out, there's two ways of addressing that. Number one, we have to do a better job of growing the economy. You just extended the... Um... Absolutely. The retirement age, absolutely. And there are some persons who complain about that extension. But the fact is that the extension of the retirement age is for two reasons. Number one, it is to make sure that our pension system is more sound. People are living longer, so they have to pay into their pensions longer in order for the pension system to remain sound into the future. But I will say this on your particular point. You are correct. We can have a better and more efficient government. And we actually are making progress in that. I gave an example a few uh, on Friday that compared to 2016 to 2019, we haven't actually increased the number of persons inside the public service, yet we are working on increasing output through technology and other things. But there are programs or entry-level positions that are available, and there will be more. And any individual who is looking to enter the government, who's coming back from overseas, that is looking to enter, please send me an email at premiergov.bm. Feel free to do so, because we are creating those entry-level positions, and we want to make sure that people can. We have bursary programs that exist for positions which are, which are not filled by Bermudians. We have training opportunities for persons to fill those positions. We are always looking to fill those positions, and if you want to have a career in some obscure thing like land valuation or something else, we have placed an opportunity inside the government for you. Absolutely. Thank you. No problem. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. So we're going to move to the right. It looks like we have two more on the floor, and then we'll start to wind things down. We have about 15 minutes left in total. So go ahead. Right. Good evening. I'm Kenton Truck. Um, I know it's a very controversial topic. However, what are we going to do to break down the fear of external investment coming into Bermuda? but ensuring that we are protected as well as entrepreneurs or business persons in Bermuda. Because I think what, what's happening, for example, is we have $100 that we're currently stirring, $100 figuratively speaking, in the pot. If we increase that by foreign investment, we can have $200 that we're sharing and stirring in the pot. But I think there's this fear of if that external investment comes in, that, as you said earlier, it's all going to get sent back out of Bermuda. So what are we doing to ensure that it's an understanding and a balance between getting an external investment but ensuring that we have careers and futures and jobs as it comes along? Thank you for your question, Kenton. Um, just let me ask a clarification. When you say fear of investment, what do you mean? Meaning or from where? A fear from, I, I don't think it's from this particular segment of the community. It's the more senior segment of the community that we were talking about earlier that are afraid that if external investment comes in, certain things that is discussed on Twitter of how certain monopolies, you can only get in certain products through certain monopolies. However, if we have external investment coming in, some of us might be able to start businesses that enable us to make that money. However, I think it's a fear from other segments of the community, not necessarily everybody here, that external investment coming in is going to take the job of our uncle, of our cousin, of our dad, because the government is just going to allow them to come in and take all our money and go back overseas. Okay. So I, I think, meaning the, the balance of the government policy to ensure that external investment is coming in and it's being reinvested in Bermuda. Excellent. Thank you for that. That, that helps with the clarity. Um, I am not entirely certain that there is a fear. I think that it's a question of a time that's misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, it's as though if... We approach life in 2020 sometimes, like it's 1980, yes. before the internet, before mobile workforces, before you know jobs can just move and be located anywhere. 
And I think that's part of the particular challenge in making sure that we, when we design policies, we make sure we understand and explain them. That you cannot have the policies as worked in the past when the world itself is different. But in, to answer your question specifically, it's two parts. I don't think that Bermudians actually fear foreign investment. I don't, and I think that we welcome and encourage foreign investment. Anyone who is wealthy can come to Bermuda, can start up a company, can stay here for as long as they want to stay. And that, that is our laws right now. They will, get, they will get a permanent residency certificate, their spouse will get a permanent residency certificate, their children will get a permanent residency certificate. That exists right now. The question I, I have is not necessarily why aren't they doing that, but how to have more Bermudians participate inside of that particular investment. Mm -hmm. And so from the perspective of where we look, is that the opportunities are there, and what we want to make sure is that if you are a Bermudian and you have an idea that you can seek investment, whether that's from overseas, whether that's for someone down the road who may not have Bermudian status, who wants to be a part of growing and developing this Bermuda economy, because you are correct. What we have in our local economy is an economy that is not efficient. When we're talking about the amount of money which we pay for food, it is not efficient. And when I've heard, persons have heard me tell that story before about a supermarket owner who said that they can lower the cost of goods by 15% tomorrow if they cut out the middleman, that would never happen in any other country. So I do want to empower persons to be able to do that. And there's two portions about empowering persons to do that. Number one is the revision to the 60-40 rule, which right now persons are able to invest in those type of companies, and the Minister of Finance may be making further announcements on that. But the second portion, which is also important, is that individuals who have their own savings should be able to use their own savings to invest inside the economy. So we talk about this thing, and I think it was the guy, uh, Robert Stubbs, who wrote about the fact that one of our challenges is that our pension funds, our private pension funds, not the government pension funds, our private pension funds are mostly invested overseas. If 5% of those funds were actually invested in Bermuda, that's $150 million more million that can be used to start up businesses, to support businesses, et cetera. And the government, as I said in my delegates conference speech, is going to make that a reality. And you will probably see that before uh, the summer happens because you have to create and allow Bermudians to have that capital, access the capital, in order to grow and to create and provide composition inside the economy. Okay. Thank you. And just to close, I don't think we have a fear of foreign investment. I think there is a fear of what foreign investment may mean to Bermuda. But yeah. we live in a different time. And I would encourage everyone here who's here and everyone who's listening to talk to others to make sure we understand. Because the world's not the same as it was before. We have this act called the Bermuda Immigration Protection Act, which was written in 1956. You know, before time of internet, before time of, you know, regular long distance telephone calls. It's a different age. And if we don't adapt to a different age, we'll be left behind. And a lot of times when I find myself in conversation, I ask people, what are you trying to protect? What are you trying to protect? We have to recognize that we are in a global war for talent. We're in a global war for everything else. And what people won't find in Bermuda, they can go somewhere, somewhere else, else and find it. Yeah. And we have to make sure that we are more attractive in many different ways. So I think that your question is apt, and the government recognizes that. I recognize that we have to do things differently if we're going to be successful in the future. Thank you. Final floor question. Good evening. Um, my question is quite similar. I just wanted to dig a little bit deeper from the other young lady's question about um, you've raised the age of retirement which is the largest, how will maybe employed going to grow within a space where they're already to move up the ladder, a space where, frankly, it's already an aging population. That's an aging culture. I know that their government reform is a future forward Bermuda. You yourself are a techie. You found us all on Twitter. I don't think the rest of the civil service is using Twitter. How, how are you going to reconcile the two cultures and how, how is that going to work for the young people of Bermuda and the government that you hope is going to lead the future? Thank you for that question, Carly. I'm going to answer it two ways. I'm going to say it in the way that I feel, and then I'm going to ask for um, a different perspective.
The first way in which I'm going to answer that is that um, one of the things that was also discussed earlier was a, um, an actual identification of high flyers in the public service, and we're going to have a special training program for those high flyers, so those are the ones who, you know, demonstrate the outside of the box thinking, demonstrate the fact that they can do things, so they can go into a special training program, so when roles present themselves, whether it be acting opportunities or actually vacancies inside of senior management or head of the department roles, persons can be placed into those particular roles throughout government, because that's it. There is a challenge, because in the public service, if you have a position, you are technically in that position for life unless you mess up. And so it, it, it causes a particular challenge when people feel as though if they have to <laughs> advance. But that's the system of which we have. I think the best thing to do is to ensure that persons who are high flyers can have that opportunity to act up and to act up in different places to gain that type of leadership experience and possibly say, you know, it might be arts and culture, but you might find something synergistic which actually can take into account your uh, new approaches to things. The second part of that question is simple. I need more persons who are young to use their voice, to talk about what the future is, to talk about the fact that there are persons who actually don't feel that they'll have a future inside of this country. And we need to actually have that conversation about what does the future hold? Because progressive policies are certainly necessary in order for Bermuda to compete. And progressive policies don't mean that they have to be the exclusion of persons who are here. They can be used to make sure that we continue to build people up. But that's what it is. It's about making sure that we continue to have that conversation. So when you say, I'm someone who you know, uses social media and Twitter, I think that you have to continue to encourage and use your voice and say, when there's something that is, because I'm just going to be honest with you, politicians, 95% of the times, all we get is criticism. Mm. If there's something that's actually good and makes sense, if people would actually support that as well, then I think that you'll see more things that can build on top of that. And I think that's something that's important in our public discourse, which we do not have enough of. So I recognize your concern about being able to move and advance the public service. It is a difficult animal, but what we're doing with the government reform initiative and identifying high flyers is something that will help. But I think it's also incumbent on the next generation, because I'm no longer young, I'm now 41. They keep talking about I'm the youngest mm -hmm. pre Bermuda's history, but I feel the age happening. It's about persons who know that the decisions that I make now are going to have more of an effect on them than it is their parents to continue to speak up and to support policies which are progressive, which will help the next generation. Because if the only persons making noise are those that are in opposition, then those are the ones that will drown out. And I think it's important that people actually use their voice in support of things which may be helpful for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Premier, we were told to wrap it up. But I have a serious question. I, I like, I Before like, we get to the wrap-up question, I promise after this Doc, question we'll Doc's be the wrap-up question. getting mad at me. She's like, no. But this, 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 to, it, this is personal to me and, and has to be personal to everyone in this room. And it's a subject that we haven't touched yet tonight. Just over 10 years ago, I, I received a call in the middle of the night. And I went to the hospital. And my first cousin, who I grew up with, one of the closest people to me, had a bullet that went through this side of his head and out this side of his head. I can't get it out of my head. And if the blood was still dripping on the floor, that's how, you know, fresh that this, that, that, that this was. The amount of people in this room is almost the equivalent of the, the amount of people that we have lost since that time here in Bermuda, every single life has been lost senselessly. Just last week, we had a mom who was, I mean, you could not watch that video without either crying or just completely feeling ripped apart because all she wanted was her son to have a safe place either in Bermuda or to, to leave the island before his life was taken. And she said that she has no options. We have over 500 people right now that are live streaming, and we have a room full of people. All of us want to get on top of this. What is your advice as the leader of this country to try and, and, and protect our young men, the innocent people, 
and to restore faith that this country can be a place where all of us can, can, can love again and to be in unity. Thank you for that question, Kian. Um, and it's a situation that has been uh, faced far too often um, in the last 10 to 11 years by any numbers of Bermudian families. And um, a vast majority of black families have been affected. Um, and the challenge um, that we have is that it's multi-generational. Um, and it's not just on the policing side in order to fix the issue. Um, it has to be fixed um, in uh, not only with programs and making sure that opportunities are provided. So when we sit around the cabinet table and we talk about the resources of the government and how those resources are going to be deployed, I remember last year the Minister of National Security says he needed 600 extra thousand dollars for a gang intervention program, detention farm, more persons to assist, pass for being and all the rest. And we did not increase our overall spending, but we found money from around the table to make sure that we put towards those particular programs. I think that there's two parts to your question. The first part is, or the last part of which you asked, is how do we as a community get past this and come together? I think that it's important that we demonstrate it insofar as loving and engaging with one another. And I think that is particularly important. But I think what's also important is we need to be honest. And we need to hold our family and friends accountable. We have to. We have to make sure that we hold people accountable. Because as much as the government tries to help, if individuals don't want to do their part to help themselves, then no, sol no problem is going to be solved. And so we can do our best in providing the avenues, whether it's what we have right now at Redemption Farm, where there's at-risk youths who are currently being redirected into productive um, lives and productive activities, whether it's the fact that there are multiple on a daily basis gang intervention programs inside the schools which have been expanded underneath our government, whether it's the reintroduction of programs in the prisons which were cut out of the budget prior to us coming in where we had to make sure we reinstated those programs inside the prisons, and whether it's about insofar as I would say the community itself making sure that community engagement increases. But it's a multi-generational issue. Um, and it's not something that's going to be solved overnight. Are we making progress? Absolutely. Do I fear that call that um, someone else is going to be uh, shot and killed? I absolutely do. Um, the last person who was murdered was my cousin. Uh, but the fact is that we have to, in our lives, make sure that we are honest with our family, honest with our friends, honest with the persons who are involved in these particular activities because a lot of times we can also inadvertently enable them by our silence, enable them by us not speaking up about these particular issues. And that's a challenge for us, it is. Um, we've made progress. I know that the team, I would say that Pastor Leroy Bean is the hardest working person in government. I would say so, I mean he works endless hours. I know that he has a team of persons that work with him day in and day out to try to calm the tensions, ease the tensions, redirect the tensions and make sure that we put things in place for individuals uh, to succeed. But a part of it also is economic conditions. And though we see um, a growth in international business and you know increasing jobs in certain places, we need to also have other jobs which are, uh, and making sure that we continue to invest in training uh, for persons who may have not finished school, for persons who may be on the wayside, for persons who want to redirect themselves into positive energy. But we have made progress, and I think that's the key point. The work that's being done with the uh, gang reduction team is making progress, but now the criminals are getting brazen. I mean, the fact that people shooting into houses where children are, are not things that you would have seen nine or 10 years ago. These are things that were targeted, and so it's going to require a different approach. But it requires all of us to have those conversations with our families, to have them, because persons are not living right, and if family who know that persons aren't living right aren't going to confront them, then we're going to continue to have these challenges, and it's a community effort which needed. So the government has led, the government will continue to put the resources which are necessary into combating that problem, but it's going to require more, and I know that the Minister of National Security has invited those persons to come in, we will continue to invite those persons to come in. We're going to continue to provide additional resources to training, to retraining to those type of programs and intervention programs. And I think over the long run, it will have its effect. 
Thank you very much. I'm going to go down a, a short list and then I'm going to leave you with the final word. So thank you, uh, Team Birmingham, Dejan, uh, Maya back there working really, really hard. Uh, hi, I'm Kian. Um, Daniel Woods, The Shake Hands, CITV. I mean, the setup here is incredible. We've got multiple camera views. It's the first time I've ever had like multiple camera views. I'm not behind. Oh, female. <laughs> camera person. The Department of uh, Communications, the Cabinet Office staff, uh, Jakai from the BTA, uh, who runs all of the B BTA facilities, his, his hard at work. Uh, Albert Sound, we have Kenny Catering, I saw you grab some chicken wings. Yes. You had your own little halftime show. Uh, exclusive events, and also Digicel because they upped the, the level of service because they didn't want anything to compromise the feed. And so we also want to thank all of you for coming. Give yourselves a round of applause because this is beautiful. <laughs> this is incredible. And also we're, we're giving a round of applause for those of you tuning in online. I got a, a message just now. The last time that they have seen this much people online was something that was breaking news. So I want to say breaking news. Young people, contrary to popular belief by some, care about Bermuda, are energized about Bermuda, and want to make a difference. We don't just want to be a voice, your voice, PDA. We want to be a part of this. And we want to thank you, Premier Bermuda, for putting together this unprecedented event, for partnering with us, which is a huge audience. It's not, you know, any one person in this room or online that is not an appreciation of, of, of this opportunity. So the final question is, can we have more opportunities like this? And what's your vibe on, on this? Uh, thank you, Kian. Uh, I do want to thank the all-female uh, camera team and crew who have been so excellent, uh, all the persons who have helped to put this particular event together, and all of those who gave uh, support and advice uh, to myself um, and my team online. Uh, the short answer to your last question is, will we have more opportunities to do things like this? Absolutely. Um, I found that this is to be useful, but the real challenge for the government of Bermuda and for myself with the government that we lead is not only to listen, uh, but to execute. And so I know that there was a number of questions which came in, and my staff is probably going to be upset at me right now because I'm going to undertake to try to provide an answer to all of them so people can actually know and have a feeling that they did not submit their questions in vain because I want to make sure that we actually um, reply uh, to all of them because I think that information sharing is important. Um, what I want to say is, and my vibe for this, is that it's hopeful. When I said at the initial stages that I didn't actually think that the response would be as good as the response was and that people wanted to hear, I think that it's gratifying to actually recognize that people of the generation of which I used to be a part of have not tuned out, actually do care about the future. And I was not too far removed. I remember when I came back to me at the age of 23, I got involved with the Progressive Labor Party because my neighbor told me if I joined the PLP, on Monday night, I can go and ask the premier of the country questions. And I joined the PLP the next day, and I showed up in a meeting. And my big thing back when I, was, uh, when I moved back to Bermuda was the question of immigration and opportunities for young Bermudians. Because when I came home, I remember uh, sending out 23 resumes trying to get an IT job and not getting a single response. I know that feeling. So I recognize and understand the feelings and challenges of, of, uh, of young people because I'm not too far removed from there. But I think that it's also important that we not, as I said, only listen, but demonstrate the changes in policies of which we're making to ensure that this country is sustainable for the future. Because we have, I don't want to say we have difficult choices to make. I don't think the choices are that difficult, actually. What I actually think is that we need voices that support change, voices that support transition, voices who want to be a part of building that future, to speak up. And so I'm gratified that there's as many persons who have reached out. I want persons to continue to hold me accountable. You can always reach out to my office at premier.gov.bm. 
The only social media that I check myself is Twitter. So if you're sending a message to another social media channel, someone else will be most likely responding. But I want to continue the engagement because it's important that we not only hear, but we also make changes. And sometimes good ideas come from here. And I've got a few tonight. And the questions, which I know came in, are uh, on for them. Ah, thank you, Dana, for reminding me. Um, for those persons who did not get questions asked here, who wanted to ask questions, um, and for those persons online, every month I host a chat and chew in the cabinet office uh, where I have about 10 persons come in on a various issue. And one of the things I said was that the chat and chew, which we're hosting this Monday at lunchtime in the cabinet office, would be for persons who either didn't get to come this evening or didn't get to answer, ask their questions. So please see uh, Dr. Selassie after this if you want to attend uh, my chat and chew, which is taking place um, next week, Monday, at the cabinet office at 12 o'clock. Um, but with that, there will be more. Um, I was told that I was discriminating on age, so I need to uh, speak to people that are in my generation. Um, we do have, I was told that, you give me that look, the people are upset, they're like, what about us? I'm not, you know, I, I wanna be heard from too. And so it's a continued process of engagement because one of the, and I'll be honest with all of you, one of the, I think, challenges that I have in my approach to my job is that I sometimes get so consumed in doing the work that I don't get the opportunity to have these type of interactions. And I think that these type of interactions are healthy and I will uh, certainly commit to doing more, to not just to hear, but also to share of the work of which we're doing and to invite people to be a part um, of that uh, particular change. So with that, I want to uh, thank you, Kian. I want to thank the team at Burmeams. I want to thank everyone who helped to be a part of this event. And I want to thank you all for watching Feel free to, as I said, send in and shoot more questions if you have any. And for all those you attending, I just want to say uh, thank you. My job is to make sure that our futures in this country can be secure. And I want you to continue to hold myself as a leader of the government accountable and continue to share your thoughts and ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Your island, your voice. Hashtag your voice, PDA. Keep the conversation going. Thank you and good night. Go downstairs and the Premier is going to make himself available to 